Good morning, this is Gary Glaub in Morrisville, North Carolina. Today we are going to finish James chapter 4. I'm calling this one, Here Comes the Judge. James 3, 16 through 17 reminded us that where envy and strife are present as Christians, we are to show mercy. Otherwise, we are more focused on ourselves than on others. Strife is defined as an angry or bitter disagreement over fundamental issues. We might call it stirring the pot. Certainly, chaos is not the answer either. But there is quite a difference between reporting a neighbor to the police when we hear a gunshot inside of their house and being upset because they do not cut their grass often enough. In today's section in James 4, James expounds on our relationships with those around us. James 4, verses 11 through 12, says this. Do not speak against one another, brothers and sisters. The one who speaks against a brother or sister, or judges his brother or sister, speaks against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law... You are not a doer of a law of the law, but a judge of it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you judging your neighbor? We always will be disappointed if we expect others to do what we do and think as we think. But in all truth, we would disappoint ourselves if held to the same standards because we still have sin natures. We will fail in our own self-expectations. Words are powerful, and in our words, we can easily step into judgment. Judgment comes from the heart, not just from words. There's a huge difference between witnessing a violent crime and reporting it to the police and making a judgment against a neighbor based on our perception of the truth. For example, let's say the neighbor has many visitors late at night and we tell all of the other neighbors that they're dealing drugs. Do we know that is the truth or have we just come to a conclusion based on a very partial version of the truth? Without knowing the truth in many circumstances, we can destroy someone's reputation. The worst part is that in so doing, we have stepped from our role as neighbor into the role of Jesus. Not even the Father will step into that role. John 5, 2 says this, For not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son. Jesus is the only judge, and for good reason. Not even the wisest man on the earth is omniscient or can see intent. Jesus knows everything, and that includes the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. This passage does not seem to differentiate between speaking against a brother or sister to their face or speaking against a brother or sister to others, but it would seem that gossip is even worse, as we have removed our neighbor's opportunity to defend themselves against our judgmental words when we speak badly about them to others. Jesus summarized the Ten Commandments in just these two. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. It's pretty difficult to speak against a neighbor while loving them. No one wants to be judged. But Jesus reminded us that how we are judged will be a reflection of how we have judged others. Matthew 7 1 through 5 says this, Do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged, and by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, Let me take the speck out of your eye, and look, the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. It makes perfect sense that imperfection cannot judge 
imperfection. But only perfection can judge perfection. We are all sinners, and to judge is to condemn another, pass sentence on that person. We also can destroy someone's reputation by our judgmental words. That imperfect neighbor easily can judge us in the same manner, as we are also imperfect. Stirring the pot up in this manner will not lead to a peaceful life, but continuous strife. Let God handle it. He does not need our help. All right, let's finish James 4, verses 13 through 17. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow, for you are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So for one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, for him it is sin. In comparison with eternity, even the life of Methuselah was brief. We are candles in the wind. There is nothing wrong with having hopes, dreams, and desires. But if those are founded in the Lord rather than in our own selfish ambition, we have a much better chance of God showing his mighty hand in the midst. Differentiate between a Christian man who goes to med school because he wants to help others and a Christian man who goes to med school because he wants to be wealthy. Notice that the example in verse 13 identifies making plans in order to profit. Profit, P-R-O-P-H-E-T, speaking God's word, is more beneficial than profit, P-R-O-F-I-T. Mark 8.36 says this, For what does it benefit a person to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? Each of us has to make decisions. And as Christians, we pray for God's help when making those decisions. Sometimes we hear an obvious yes or an obvious no, but often we are unsure of God's answer and unsure of what we are to do. Most of the time, we simply step out in faith, hoping that we did the right thing. We should look more closely at our own intentions, though. Is this simply for pride or for profit? Or can we see a way to point to Jesus in this plan? When unsure of God's answer when praying of a new plan or opportunity, remember that the greatest promise this side of heaven should give us comfort. Romans 8.28 And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Just remember that good in God's eye involves us drawing closer to him, and God can use difficulties in our lives to accomplish that increased closeness with him. We cannot see the future, not even for a second. The world could end with asteroids or atomic bombs before this sentence is finished. The rapture could occur at any second, and as it is appointed unto every man to die, any of us could die at any moment. This passage, while reminding us of our lack of knowledge in regard to an earthly future, is also encouraging us to keep our eyes on our heavenly future. God will take care of our needs if we are his. Though there certainly is a difference between our needs and our selfish desires. Just as the flowers are clothed more majestically than King Solomon, God will provide for our needs. This chapter ends while reminding us that boasting in our arrogance is evil. That arrogance is acting like we know more than we actually know, like what will happen next year. The final verse of the chapter gives us a bit of a different spin on sins of ignorance. And sins of ignorance... Even when we are not aware of the sin, it still is sin. 
in this explanation, when we know the right thing and don't do the right thing, it also is sin. Philippians 4.8 says this, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, think about these things. It can be a bit daunting or even depressing to understand how difficult it can be to not sin, especially when we know that sin separates us from God. While we should continue to live godly lives and address the sin in our lives, perhaps we should focus on how amazing it is that Jesus went 33 years on this earth without an impure action or an impure thought. God does not want us to feel destroyed by our sin. Instead, he wants us to know the joy of forgiveness because God sent his son to come to us, speak to us, die for us, and pay for our sins. Walk in the joy of what Jesus has done for us as he gave it all, but don't minimize the effects of our sinful behavior, particularly how it affects others who do not know Jesus. This is Gary Glaub in Mooresville, North Carolina. Have a blessed day.